am Cynthia Holloway, city horticulturalist, and welcome to another episode of Gardening in the City. Today we have Dr. Alan Wyndham with us, and he is the plant pathologist at UT Ag Extension. Alan, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? Okay. Cynthia, my specialty is the diseases of ornamental plants and turf grass and trees. Uh, and I've, I've done this for 29 years. I work at the Soil Plant and Pest Center mm -hmm. at Ellington Ag Center in Nashville. And I live here in Rutherford County. Well, that's great. I see you sometimes along the roads taking photographs and samples everywhere. I do. <laughs> it's, I say that really the only people that don't have to deal with plant problems are people that don't grow plants. But for the rest <laughs> of us, occasionally we do see a problem. Okay. And today you've brought a lot of samples with us and I've been really wanting to talk to you because this is really uh, a topic that's very, very uh, interesting to a lot of people, especially not just in Murfreesboro, but in Rutherford, Rutherford County. So um, why don't you start with uh, what, this, what you've brought with okay. us today. First we'll, we'll, we'll talk about rose rosette, okay. which is a big problem on knockout rose, yes, yes. but other roses. Unfortunately. And you can see it around the city and around the county. Okay. And uh, it's, a virus, it's a virus disease of roses. You get this bunchy growth, which is very unusual mm -hmm. and not normal. Right. And it's a virus disease that's spread by mites, which makes it even harder to control. What do people need to know about rose rosette? Okay. Uh, first, we get questions about can you prune it out and we're doing research on that uh, if I had a rose that had maybe one or two rosettes I might try pruning it out if I had a rose that had three or more I'd probably dig up the rose uh, and get rid of it so a good question is can you replant with roses well actually you can oh. uh, the mite that's a vector uh, can only survive for a few days without a rose so you could wait just a very short time to replant now does that mean that the mites could not move back in from your neighbors or fence row where there's multiflora rows that could be infected. No, they could. But it's not a death sentence. It's a, for roses. You can replant in areas that have had rose rosette, mm -hmm. but you might want to choose something different than a knockout rose. Okay. So one thing I've noticed locally is that some of the rugosa roses are surviving longer with rose rosette, not getting it. So it could be that they're not as susceptible or the mite doesn't like to feed on them. Okay, that's interesting. Very interesting. All right, let's move on maybe to your next sample that you've brought us today. Okay. Uh, a, a current issue that people are calling us about are bagworms on junipers and cypress, and sometimes they'll even get on plants like laurels, and they defoliate the plant. If they are actively feeding as these are, then they need to be treated, otherwise you could lose a whole plant from this. Uh, juniper, spruce don't generally recover if you had severe damage, so you'd like to control these. Right. Now, organically, if you'd like to use an organic treatment, uh, BT works really well. That's a bacterial uh, pathogen, a bagworm. Doesn't hurt us, but it does hurt the uh, bagworm. You could spray that uh, or other insecticides. But you do, if they're still actively feeding, you do need to treat because they can cause a lot of damage. And I've noticed, of course, most people don't even know they have them until they're in this stage. Um, can they look for them prior to this stage? Is it easy to identify the crawlers? It's easy to identify. And actually, if you just pay a little attention to your juniper, you might see some discoloration going on. If you go and look, you see little, tiny bagworms that are maybe quarter inch, half an inch. That's the easiest time to control. By this time, they're much harder to control. And if they stop feeding, they're actually still up in the bag. They're mm -hmm. almost impossible to control. At that stage, all you could do is pick them, remove right. them, pick them off the plant. Right. And dispose of them properly. Dispose of them. <laughs> right. Dispose Don't just throw them. them down, Don't right? Don't just throw them on the ground because the female will lay lots of eggs in this bag and they will all hatch next year oh. and then move back up onto the plant. Oh, goodness. All right. What are some other hot topics that we want to talk about? Well, we've gotten lots of questions about this little creature on this chameleon. And all this white, fluffy material uh, is produced by a plant hopper. Oh. And we've, there are lots of, it seems to be a problem all over the state this year. We've gotten questions from Chattanooga and Jackson and other areas, and certainly the Nashville area. But you see this white, fluffy growth on perennials, on shrubs, uh, and it's a little plant hopper. And the little 
baby plant hoppers protect themselves by producing this white cottony material. And uh, the good news is, even though it's very noticeable when people notice it, it's not a problem. They do very little damage. Hmm. So in this case, you could actually hmm. ignore the insect and it's not going to do any harm. That's unusual. I would have thought that was probably mealy bugs and probably with a lot, a lot of, of people. A lot of people have thought that it was mealy bugs. Some people have thought maybe white flies or scale insects, but no, it's a little plant hopper that causes this white powdery material to, on flowers and stems and shrubs. Interesting. All right, so do nothing. Do nothing with this one. This is that, that might be the only one we have today that you want to do right. nothing. All right. Um, so tell me a little bit about when a person has a problem, um, how do they get a sample or a specimen to your lab? Okay. Well, the best advice I would have is if you have a plant problem or an insect you'd like to have identified or a weed that you'd like to have identified, take it by the UT Extension office here in Rutherford County. Mm -hmm on John Rice Boulevard, right. Mitchell Moat and Anthony Tuggle can handle most questions, but those questions that they can't handle, they would send those to us in our lab in Nashville and we would identify those. Great service, great service. They're very experienced, they're good at what they do, and they have seen lots of different problems over the years. They have, they're our go-to people and, and then you're the expert when they can't handle right. it. I act as like a consultant for extension agents across mm -hmm. the state and if they have a disease problem that they can't identify, then they'll come to me. And I think people need to know that because I don't think it's probably um, used as much as it could be. And you, you may think differently because you're getting them from all areas. But when I suggest people, you know, contact the Ag Extension, they were like, "Oh, uh, okay. I, I wasn't sure, you know, how did it go about that?" So, well, troubleshooting. Uh, for plant problems is a big thing of what we do and uh, we're pretty good at it. We've done it for a long time mm -hmm. and we see a lot of different things every year mm -hmm. and a lot of the problems we see in Rutherford County are problems that we receive from all over the state. Okay and you also um, do di uh, diagnostics on uh, turf diseases as well don't you? I do, I do. I work with sod farms, uh, homeowners that have a problem with their lawns golf courses, uh, anyone that has a turf disease problem. Again, I would start at the extension office here in Murfreesboro, and then if they have a problem, they'll come to me. Okay, all right, let's look at uh, some more in your goodie bag. Okay, well, first, we've got a begonia here, and uh, the reason that begonias are hot, a hot <laughs> plant to plant this year, is because of downy mildew of garden impatience. Mm -hmm. And downy mildew, uh, is a big problem on garden impatience in the eastern United States. It was first found in 2011, believe it or not, for the first time in wow. landscape. So it's a recent disease. It sure is. But in a short time, it's spread all over the U.S. and it's made it much more difficult to grow garden impatience. For instance, I got an email last mm -hmm. year from a gentleman that said, I've grown garden impatience for 20 years, mm -hmm. but the last two years, they've dropped all their leaves. There's no flowers. What's happening? Well, that's a perfect description of downy mildew. Mm -hmm. But while it is difficult to control, there are really nice alternative plants that we can plant that are not susceptible, such as begonias, right. New Guinea impatiens. Well, now that's, explain that, because people would be a little confused by okay. the New Guinea impatient being, uh, you know. Right, it's a different species, species. Okay. and it has resistance to downy mildew. Okay. Uh, same for sun patients, they're resistant, and I think uh, as time goes on, we'll see more and more in new introductions that are resistant to mm -hmm. downy mildew. Coleus is a good plant for shade, caladiums, uh, just about anything other than garden impatience and you're good to go. Right, and that kind of breaks my heart because I, I love impatience um, and I've planted them for years myself, but uh, I'm off of them now. Um, at the nursery, I mean, are the nurserymen indexing those or is there a process that they have to be certified for plant materials, um, you know, well, yes. disease free. Well, yes, anybody that has a greenhouse or nursery or garden center, they have a certification mm -hmm. that they work out with Tennessee Department of Agriculture. And there are plant inspectors that come by and inspect right. plants. And occasionally they do find things like downy mildew. Mm -hmm. And they see that it's destroyed and recommend what the grower should do. But in this case, it's so widespread and so difficult to control uh, my advice would be to avoid planting garden impatiens until you hear a big announcement that there are downy mildew resistant impatiens 
back on the market. So until then, New Guinean patients, Sun patients, and there's a new one, Bounce and Big Bounce mm -hmm. in patients that are resistant that'll be coming out next year. Oh, great. All right. Hello, my name is Kane Adams, and I'm the superintendent with the Urban Environmental Department. And today we're going to discuss how to properly water your newly installed plants and trees, which takes about one to three years to get those established before they don't need as much water. Um, they, those type of plants need about an inch of water per week, especially in the summertime when we're not getting our normal spring rains. Your deciduous trees and shrubs will give you some indicators on their overall health, especially with uh, how much water they're going to need. Deciduous trees and shrubs will end up the, the leaves will start to wilt, they'll droop, or they'll start to curl on you, and those are indicators that you need to go ahead and try to get some water on those. The majority of the time they'll bounce back, but sometimes they can start to defoliate, and just because they're defoliating, don't stop watering them. Sometimes they will drop their leaves, and, the, and new buds will push out, and the trees will make it all right. Whereas, on the other hand, evergreen trees don't give a lot of indicators. Um, you know, they, they'll start looking a little dry and feeling a little dry. But if they start turning brown on you due to lack of water, more than likely, they're, they're gone. So make sure to pay a little bit more attention to your evergreen trees as they are a little bit harder to tell what they actually need. Infrequent deep soakings of water is a better way to water than just a lot of small, frequent watering sessions. That allows the, the water to penetrate down deeper into the root systems and help the roots to get established a little bit better. A couple different ways we like to do that are with soaker hoses in a landscape bed. They're a little bit more efficient and you don't have a lot of runoff. And the, and the ground has a chance to absorb that, especially with our heavy clay soils here in Middle Tennessee. Uh, another way that we like to do that with our trees are the gator bags. What we have here is the original tree gator. It's for trees that have a pretty good section of clear trunk. Um, it's got an area here that you can fill up. It's also got the zipper. If you put it around the tree, zip it up. Um, so as you're filling this up, this area right here, you want to pick this up and kind of make sure you get all the wrinkles out of it as you're filling it up. The other type of tree gator is what we call the donut. It's a brown, it lays flat on the ground. It's for uh, like more, we use it more for evergreen trees and things that have a lot of low branches on them. With the donut, it holds about 15 gallons and it releases that over about six hours. Uh, it's also known as the tree gator junior. And this original tree gator right here holds about 20 gallons and it'll disperse that slowly over about an eight hour period of time. Another good option for these gator bags is when you have a uh, multi-cane tree uh, like a crepe myrtle or a sweet bay magnolia, something along those lines, you can hook two of the bags together and put it around the entire tree. Something to keep in mind is, is after you fill them up multiple times, uh, you might want to rinse the bag out and let the, let it run outside of this, this inlet right here because sometimes you'll get a little trash, debris, dirt, something down in there. These gator bags are really easy to install. You just place the bag around the tree, grab your zipper, put it in, zip it up, you're ready to fill it up with water. Watering your newly installed trees and shrubs is crucial. If you follow these important steps, your trees should be healthy and vigorous for years to come. All right, Alan. I see here that you've got some other samples out and uh, that one looks like it might be mildew, so let's start with that one. Okay, well, we just talked about downy mildew on impatiens. Mm -hmm. This is a different mildew. This is powdery mildew, which is very different. Uh, how do you tell the difference between downy and powdery mildew? Well, a good rule of thumb is if you have white fungal growth on the underside of a leaf, it's probably downy mildew. But if you have white powdery growth on the upper leaf surface, it's probably powdery mildew. Great tip. So it's on lilac. And the thing is, it's been dry, but this is a disease that does not need a lot of moisture, a lot of wet weather to be a problem. So we see powdery mildew on lilac, crepe myrtle. Mm -hmm. What else? Dogwood. Dogwood for sure. Phlox. Zinnia is also another plant that gets powdery mildew. Yes. So the big question is what to do. Well, uh, a good way to avoid powdery mildew is to choose a plant that's resistant. Mm -hmm. And for those plants that I mentioned, dogwood, crepe myrtle, phlox, zinnias, they all have mm -hmm. cultivars that are resistant to powdery mildew and that mm -hmm. is the easiest way to avoid a disease. 
But I will have to say, for people that have them established, it's a little it's a little difficult or heartbreaking to cut them down and, and get it rid is. of them. So, um, what so for of, established plants, mm -hmm. there are really good fungicides. There are organic fungicides such as neem oil. Right. They work. Sulfur yeah. works. Uh, you may have to apply fairly often, but those organic treatments do work. And then there are other fungicides that you can get at retail stores that work very well to control this. You just can't let the leaf or the plant get covered like this before you start. Okay. You can wait until you see a little bit okay. and still get good control. So what does it actually do to the plant? Well, let's, for dogwood, for instance, we've got powdery mildew on dogwood. What does it do? We mm -hmm. do know that it slows the growth of the plant. Mm -hmm. Uh, the dogwood that's infected will set fewer flower buds in the fall, so there will be fewer flowers in the, in the spring. Uh, so it's not just an aesthetic problem. It is actually stunning the plant, causing it to set fewer flowers, so there's flower buds, so there'll be fewer flowers and, and not as much fruit. Okay. And that's why we grow flowering dogwood. All right. Uh, what else have we got? Well, another hot topic this year is cedar quince rust. Mm. And we see this, where do you think we see cedar quince rust on which plants? Uh, apples. Apples and uh, cedar cedars, and right. quince. Uh, okay. And hawthorn. It's not a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> not a trick question. But we do see cedar quince rust on many different plants from hawthorn that I have here yes. to serviceberry to crab apple to pear and apple. And an interesting thing about this rust is people see the, the orange spores coming out of the fruit right now. They are deformed and they think they have to spray now to control this when actually it's too late. Uh, it, what's interesting is the spores, the orange spores that are coming out of the fruit right now are going to cedars and infecting cedars. Oh. And only in the spring are spores from the cedars coming back and infecting the fruit. Well, what a cycle. So at this point, all you could do is just kind of observe and watch. And I would say even though in Rutherford County, it's very difficult to plant a hawthorn at some distance from an eastern red cedar, uh, probably the further you get away from a, an, a, an infected cedar, which would probably be most of them, the better. You're, you'll see less, less rust. All right. And maybe you want to explain to them what the audience may look for in the infected cedar. Okay. Uh, a cedar that has a cedar rust, there are two types. One, it has a golf ball size gall on the outside of the plant that in March when we have thunderstorms come through mm -hmm. and it's kind of warm and wet, you'll see these orange finger-like mm -hmm. growths coming out of that gall. That is cedar apple rust. And those spores are going to apple, crab apple, and infecting the leaves and fruit. Well, at the same time you see that gall and all that octopus-like orange tendrils coming out, you opened up the canopy and looked in, you'd see all this little orange goo dropping off of twigs. That is the cedar quince rust. And those spores, it's a different rust, those spores are going and infecting the fruit of hawthorn, quince, and you may have twigs that are infected and die. So if you were going to try to control it with a fungicide, you would spray apple, hawthorn, those plants in the spring. Okay. And uh, UT Extension has a really nice home fruit spray schedule. You can okay. get that online uh, at UT Extension under publications and just follow that spray schedule and that should help with the rust. All right, um, let's talk about um, for all these plants and just in general, what are some cultural management practices that you might recommend? Okay, so some, some good things that people can do to avoid diseases. Mm -hmm. Number one, look when you buy. Just make sure that the, the foliage is healthy on the plant that you're buying. Uh, if the plant's in a cell pack or container, I would slide it out and look at the roots and make sure that the roots are healthy. So that would be number one. Number two, be an informed consumer. When you go shopping for a plant, know that there are resistant plants available. Mm -hmm. uh, at UT, we developed the Appalachian series of dogwoods, right. you resistant. And, you and your brother? Yes, my brother and I <laughs> and Bob Trajano. Kind of runs in the family, right. that plant pathology all, thing, doesn't right. it? Right. <laughs> all, all on the faculty at UT, we developed the Appalachian series of dogwoods that are resistant. So, number two, you need to be informed that there are resistant plants. Among the crepe myrtles, Natchez. Oh, my favorite. Great tree form, resistant to powdery mildew. Mm -hmm. And like I said earlier, there are zinnias and phlox resistant to powdery mildew. So know that those 
have to do a little research, but know that those are available. Our lab has a fantastic Facebook page. We update it daily. Current issues that we're seeing, which is a good way to stay informed, it's the Soil Plant Pest Center Facebook page. So just go to Facebook, search for Soil Plant Pest Center, pops right up, like us and follow us, and you will stay up to date on anything that's going on in gardens that you need to know. Well, I know I've liked you, and um, I, I do follow it, and it's very informative. And I, I might have even seen, you might have seen some of my comments that I, I have. <laughs> I know that you follow it, and we appreciate that. Yes. And then what else can we do? Right plant in the right place. For instance, Pachysandra, which is a good ground cover for shade. If it's planted in sun, it's going to be stressed and more susceptible to diseases. Right. Um, what about plants, um, variegated plants? Do you find that um, sometimes they're more susceptible? I haven't really seen that. I haven't really seen that variegated plants are more susceptible. Some of the variegated hostas, possibly if they're in full sun, may mm -hmm. show a little leaf scorch. But no, I really haven't noticed the problem with variegation and associated it with insect or disease okay. problems. Um, maybe talk, I just thought about the hosta. Aren't there some um, things we need to really look at it, uh, with our hostas? Well, a few years ago, I worked with a graduate student who was doing a study on viruses that affect hosta. Mm -hmm. and there's a virus called Hosta Virus X. <laughs> that's the name. It's well, not that we don't know what it is. Mm -hmm. That's the name of the virus. But she was doing a study of all the different viruses we find in Hosta. At the time, you could walk into almost any garden center and find Hosta that were infected with viruses. Now it's much harder. It's been a point of emphasis on the growers and mm -hmm. the people that inspect plants to look for those, make sure they don't wind up in garden centers. So actually, that's good news. Mm -hmm. uh, what else can somebody do to avoid diseases? On our woody plants, probably the best thing they can do is to make sure that they're well watered during dry periods. Mm -hmm. Plants like Leyland cypress, plants like rhododendron and azalea. If they are stressed, they are much more susceptible to fungal canker diseases, which cause branch dieback. Mm -hmm. And once you have that, there's really nothing you can do other than go in and prune out those dead branches, which is in itself not a bad disease control. When I walk around in my garden, I always carry mm -hmm. a pair of pruners. Uh, if I see dead branches, I'll go ahead and print it out because sometimes they are caused by fungi mm -hmm. that can move down that branch and keep killing. So if you print it out, that can help a lot. I like to sterilize my pruners too a lot when I'm moving from plant to plant. I guess I was, that's just a practice that, uh, that's I, a, that I learned. Sterilizing pruners is not a bad practice. And also, if I'm, doing, if I'm pruning healthy plants, I prune those first and then move to some that I think are diseased and I'm going to mm -hmm. prune some dead branches out so I don't spread from the disease to the healthy. Good idea. All right. Well, Alan, thank you so much for being with us today. We've certainly enjoyed it and I just want the audience to know that, um, you know, visit your plant and pathology um, people at the Ag Extension and that's on uh, Lane Park, I believe. Is that the yes, at Lane Agri Park Lane on John Park, Rice Boulevard. John Rice Boulevard, and take advantage of uh, that service that they offer. Thank you for being here today, and we look forward to seeing you on another episode of Gardening in the City.